away. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome, Lauren. Uh, welcome to this first expert session uh, hosted by the LifeSpace community. Um, we are so excited to have you here today. Lauren is a journalist turned digital marketer um, and one of the best storytellers in the world, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many others. She has been an entrepreneur for over a decade and has built the brands of some of the most influential companies in the world like Chanel, Loft, um, YouTube. Uh, she has also co-founded a startup um, that was sold to Twitter within like six months. Uh, so she's all around badass and we're very excited to have her in the life space community. Today, she's going to be talking to us about how to find your voice, uh, build your audience, and lead with authority. So um, please do prepare your questions. I will be monitoring the chat, um, and Lauren will answer the questions when she's ready. OK, so welcome, Lauren. Great. Do you still see me in present mode, my screen? Yes. All right, awesome. So. Today we are going to talk about leading authority. And I'm standing up because the last time I presented on Zoom, I was sitting down and I realized I couldn't breathe. And so it wasn't good. So a little something different here today. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to find your voice, create value, and move forward through the world with conviction. And whether you're looking as to do this as an advocate where you're changing lives and minds or as an entrepreneur where you're looking to make bank, either way, this will apply. So this is three sections. Feel free. I can see, I think, the Q&A, um, but I cannot see the uh, chat. So actually, Celia, maybe just help me out if you want to interrupt me. Sure. So three sections. We're going to talk about finding your voice and then big and quick win or uh, moving forward with conviction and then how to win with this strategy. So I'm Lauren Proctor. I have one goal today and that it's that you walk forth after this presentation with confidence and that you leave it a better person than what you were when you first sat down moments ago. So let's start with how to find your voice. And in many ways, this is how to find your purpose because you influence the world. One of my favorite authors is actually a blogger and his name is Tim Urban. He writes this blog called Wait But Why. And if you're looking for amazing nuggets for life, I really recommend him. Um, he wrote that whatever shape your career path ends up taking, the world will be altered by it. And I would extend this beyond just your career, but also your life, because everything we do has, I guess, a butterfly effect. And so it doesn't matter so much, now more so than ever, where you are now. And so if you take stock of your life, know that where you are today can always change. Because as Rumi says, everything in the universe is within you. And so when you think about how you're spending your days or your hours or your months, will you be thankful for the investments that you made over that time? And if you don't feel that you're thankful for what you're doing or that you feel that you need to make a pivot, you can always create who you are. That's okay. And as you move forward looking for your purpose, you have to remember that clarity is everything because in order to make a maximum impact, your voice has to be clear or else it's muddled. You have to find the right signal, but to do so, you have to get rid of the noise. So whether you already know your purpose or you don't yet know it yet, we have to remember that it's important to get rid of the social media and all the things that are muddling up what it is that we're doing right now. And that's a hard thing to do because every day the algorithms of social media are getting smarter. They're vying for our attention because in today's society, everything is about attention. Everything is about monetizing our attention, in fact. And so if you have a really clear and deep purpose, you'll find the how 
that you need in order to turn that purpose into reality. And if you miss the mark every single try, but you spent your life knowing that you actually gave everything that you had to this purpose and something worthwhile, then you will know that you've spent your life right. And so there's some homework for today, if you choose to take it, and it's to take stock of your life and look at, are you just staying busy? Are you the rocking horse who's always moving back and forth, doing busy work, but not actually making progress and moving forward? Are you on a horse or a rocking horse? And if you clear the noise, what does your life look like after that? And then think about if you don't yet know what it is you want to invest in, how you want to connect to your skills, your hobbies, and your experience in order to monetize or create advocacy for the things that you stand for. And if you're having trouble with this, if you don't yet know what your thing is, then check your calendar. Look at what it is in the last month that you've done or the last year that you've done that really meant something, that gave you meaningful experience. And look at your credit card statements. What is it that you're spending your money on? And if you want further guidance on this, I actually am going to do a free uh, two week challenge where we meet one to two times per week and we go through the nitty gritty how of how to achieve this. And so the secret to all of this finding your purpose is that most people don't actually do this. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's that we have acquired ADHD and no attention span, but most likely it's because it's hard. And that is why it's valuable because our, our bodies are engineered to be as efficient as possible, as lazy as possible. We're designed the way that we walk to expend the fewest number of calories possible. And that extends throughout our life. So if you know your purpose, how do you move forward with conviction so that you can make an impact? So Joseph Campbell has looked at, I think it was a thousand or 10,000 myths. And he found this common story of the hero. And he found that there's a hero call that comes to people. And that if they take this hero call, they must go through trials and tribulations and struggle like Spider-Man or Superman, or you could think of a hundred heroes, a thousand heroes in society who we idolize. And they go through these trials and tribulations, and then they come out of the process better, bigger heroes. And so everyone in today's life has a hero's call. And if you want to achieve big dreams, you have to be willing to grind it out like the Supermans of the world and actually transform yourself like Spider-Man so that you can be a hero. Because now in today's society, we need these heroes. We crave these heroes more than ever before. And so this is really scary, right? How do we do this? And most of us avoid the ship because we're afraid that it might wreck. And if you find that fear is something that you face constantly and that it causes you to avoid doing things, look at Tim Ferriss's fear exercise. He calls this the most meaningful activity that he does. I think he does it monthly. And what he does is he looks at the fear and he imagines what is the worst thing that would happen if this fear were to take place. And then he compares that to what would happen if he never even tried to do the thing that he imagined. And in every case, almost every case, the fear of never having tried is much worse than his worst imagined fear 
of scrutiny or being you know dis being reprimanded or whatever it might be being hated on and so when you're looking at how to move forward with conviction and how to prioritize your time so that you're on a racing horse instead of a rocking horse you can look at the 80 20 rule and this was first founded by an economist who was growing peas in his garden and he found that 20% of the peas in his garden produced 80% of the edible pea pods. So he started to look at this rule and he started to realize that 20% of the people held 80% of the wealth, 80% of a business's products or 20% of a business's products make 80% of the sales. 20% of the things that you do today will make 80% of the impact. And so the idea is that we don't have very many minutes or hours in our lives or in our careers. And so what can you do with the 20% of your time to produce the 80% of results? And this is hard to do. Again, we go back to it's hard to be an expert. It's hard to be an authority. It's hard to be a hero. But the opportunity for those people is bigger than ever. So it's important actually to create the work that you're proud of and to remember the people that you seek to serve because the work that you do will make a difference to your market, whether it is you're, you're the rocking horse or whether you're the hero, it really matters. And so you have to dig deep for drivers of value. And there's an old Benjamin Franklin quote that says, have me, um, it's, uh, this is not verbatim clearly, but it's something to the effect of ask me to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening my blade. And the idea is there is that you have to plan for what it is that you want to do. You can't just go out and spew a bunch of marketing materials out or expect to put a bunch of signs up and get everybody to agree to your cause. And so you really want to think about what you can deliver to the world that you would buy if you were on the other end, or maybe not buy, but buy into. And you don't necessarily need to know the mechanism yet. If you join my challenge, then I will help you find that mechanism because we could never do it in an hour. And you just need to trust the process because if you dig deep, you will have something remarkable because so few people today dig deep because we expect to press a button and open our garage door. We expect to order a food on our app and have it delivered to us automatically. We're in this economy where we expect people to do what our moms once did for us, like drive us to the bar or not to the bar, to the restaurant. <laughs> And so one thing as you go through this process is to learn from every action that you take, to think about your life, to think about your marketing experience or your path to heroism or authority as a feedback loop. And the number of feedback loops that you have in your lifetime and learn from, of course, will affect where you're able to go from a trajectory standpoint. So the more feedback loops you create actually increase your chances of success. And when this starts to work, you will get haters. You will have people who disapprove of what you do. And there's this man, James Victoria, he does a whole, I think, courses on how to find your voice. And he says that if you're pleasing everyone, you're not pushing hard enough. And I think that's really true, especially for the advocates who I found on this group who believe who are fighting for equality, for example. So the homework for this section is to hear and really listen for your hero call. It's to know that you are ready for battle and to trust that process. And then in your battles to find your 80-20, to 
to look at the experiences and experiments that you can do now that will have the biggest impact. And then to create those feedback loops so that you learn more quickly than anyone else in the field. Because everyone is born, well, not everyone is born not on an equal plane, but everyone kind of has a similar IQ or a similar setup. But the amount that you can learn is compounding. And those compounding results can cause you to uh, really stand out in the future. This is why like pretty much in kindergarten, everybody can kind of cut the same and write the same sort of, but by the time you're 40, certain people are great writers and other people are just okay. And so we live in this world of compounding interest and second and third order consequences. What this means is that if you look at Warren Buffett's wealth, it went like this and then whew, it's a hockey stick growth, right? And because most of what we have and deliver today is digital or can be delivered digitally, we're able to get this hockey stick growth much more quickly than ever before. The vehicles for compounding interest are more profound than they've ever been. This is why in the past, you could be a, you know, a pretty good musical artist, but there wasn't recording. And then when recording happened, you were able to become a known artist. And now that Spotify happens, you can get millions of views overnight. And so because of compounding interest and this fact that so few people think about their 80-20 and the second and third order consequences of if I do this today, what will it look like in 10 years? Like Warren Buffett's wealth, if I put away just 50% of my paycheck or 10% of my paycheck, what will that look like? And it's always like this. The difference between a 5% compounding interest and a 10% compounding interest is 10x in 10 years. And so many people give up at the beginning. And that's because we forget these fundamental tr truths. So it's important to keep going, to keep pushing, to keep moving beyond your hero's journey. So how do you actually apply all this? What are the big and quick wins? So we, believe, we live in this wild west world where everybody believes in overnight success and that you can do something, you know, this is the trick that you can happen. You know, you can be the biggest, greatest thing overnight if you just do this one thing and it's because they're selling you something. But this is actually hard work, just like we've been saying. And so you have to be willing to experience complexity and overwhelm and have the confidence that you're going to get through it because simplicity lies on the other side of complexity. And you can look at, all right, I know what my expertise is. I know what my passion is. Now, what do people want? And here are a few tools that you can look at to look at how to tie what you're offering into the things that people are demanding on the internet. I have this diagram here below of, um, of butterfly PT and it's, this is Google Trends. And what it shows is between 2015 and today, how many people are actually Googling for butterfly PT? And so this dotted line here below is, sh is showing you that Google expects this trend to go up really high. And so then if you're in the cocktail space, maybe, for example, um, or maybe you sell tea, you might consider, whoa, blue cocktails are gonna be hot or color changing cocktails because that's what butterfly tea does. And um, so you want to hit these trends right at this place at the point when they're accelerating. And then you can use tools like Social Animal and BuzzSumo to understand what it is that people are talking about in your space. And then you can see SimilarWeb 
to look at once you've identified your competitors in your space who are say doing butterfly PT, you can look at who are the similar people? How are they talking about this? What's working? What's not working? Who's becoming more popular and why? And if you want to make an e-commerce uh, pro uh, product, there's a research pl platform called Cart, or there's another one called Trends for other businesses that can be founded. And these things all allow you to see how you can take what your ex expertise is and actually capitalize on it. And today, more than ever, the world values authenticity. There are huge opportunities on platforms like YouTube and TikTok and podcasts. And because the world values authenticity, you don't have to go to market polished. You just have to go to market as you are, sincere. There's something I heard recently and I've started, I've started to test it out and it's that if you want to become a trending podcast on iTunes, you actually only need 250 downloads of your podcast. And so imagine what you could do if you could just right after you release that podcast, get 250 of your friends to download it. You get this huge spotlight on this platform that you have never been able to have before. YouTube is wide open. Viewership is skyrocketing and there's still plenty of room. If you know how to find the gaps in the market, there's plenty of room to tie what you're doing into huge audience growth. The same for TikTok. You can get a thousand views overnight on TikTok, and it is possible to show the right kind of empathy and target the right kind of viewers. And I know this because I've seen other people do it. And also, as a gay person, I get a ton of gay people TikToks. So what they're doing in the algorithm is they're actually targeting people who are exactly the type of thing they, they're into the thing that you're delivering. And Medium right now is great for syndication because Twitter is, owns me, Medium. And it's this blogging platform that you want to first blog on the platform that you own and then push it to Medium because Medium is trying desperately to succeed, to drive viewership. And so if you, first post on your platform and show Google that you own this piece of content and then put it on Medium and get some claps, which is their likes, then you can very easily game the algorithm and be a category leader. And then similarly, if you look at other investments by these big platforms like Google just invested in a platform called Keen because they want to compete with Pinterest. That's an opportunity when you're at the very, very beginning to create maybe not super great content, but get a huge following. And I don't advocate for creating bad content all the time, but it's important to be willing to learn out loud because the best ideas should be shared more than once. And even if you're just synthesizing other people's knowledge in the beginning before you find your own voice, your filter will often surface something that people weren't already aware of. A lot of times experts subconsciously do things like designers. They don't necessarily know why they're doing something. And so that if you want to write about design or learn design, you can talk about that process that they're going through. You can talk to other experts to get public validation and credibility because through association. And then you can surface how that happens through your filter. You're creating something unique and you are building an audience every time that you're learning out loud. And we know this works because the, the old, of the old adage that every story has been told before. And for example, it's the reason why we still watch the Romeo and Juliet love and basketball remake, even though Shakespeare 
did Romeo and Juliet long, long ago. And so if you think about these feedback loops, as you're developing your authoritative voice, you want to write and you want to test your value hook. Because again, everyone in today's economy is vying for your attention. And the more attention you give to any one thing, the more money you will also give to that thing. And so when you're testing your value hook, that's often your headlines or the first line of your Facebook post or the image on your Pinterest pin. This is all really good ways to, before you write your book or write your big article in ink, to see what really resonates with people. This is why BuzzFeed became so popular as a publication. It's because they have just tons and tons of headline testing that taught them exactly what causes people to click. And so if you write these small experiments on these smaller platforms like Facebook groups or things like that, like, and there's Facebook groups about literally everything from gender equality to cocktails to e-commerce. And so join it and see where you can create value. See how you can test different hooks and see where people give you feedback because the things that go viral on Facebook are not only proof that you can use when you pitch a bigger editor at the New York Times or something like that, or when you pitch Penguin Books or whatever book publisher, you can say, hey, look, I have this platform of 100,000 followers who every time I write about this, they are like all over it. And so that is how you build expertise in really small everyday ways, how you create these experiments and these feedback loops to your advantage. And so we're living through the great redo, the great refactoring of society because our technology is from 2020 but the operating systems of our minds and our societies are hundreds, if not thousands of years old. We're seeing this today with BLM in the US. People are really rethinking how police works, policing and laws and everything. And this is partially because we are helpless in a war with an invisible enemy this is a Mary Meeker quote from her 2020 COVID report on where the economy is going. And Mary Meeker, if you're not familiar with her, she, is, um, a, she works for this uh, firm called Bond. And she writes every year this report on where the internet is going and technology. And thousands of people just flock to her report. And it's because she is an authority. Every year, all year, she's looking at the trends. She's perfecting her vision. And then at the end of the year, she creates this one presentation that's huge, that provides a tremendous amount of value because there's hundreds of thousands of hours of research that go into every single one of her reports. So when you think about taking your work from these small social networks to bigger pieces of work, that's where you invest your time once you realize your value hook. Because again, we're desperate for authority in today's world. And so back to COVID, we're helpless in a war with an invisible enemy and we're in the midst of a hydra-like crisis, health, psychological, financial, and 73% of Americans report that their income, their household income has been reduced and unemployment is spiking at an incredible rate that hasn't been seen since the Great Depression. And so a lot of people are rethinking what it means to work in a regular job. And they're realizing that there's opportunity to create value outside of big corporations. And we are in the midst of a global fast break attack where experts and new think thinkers 
are making a valiant attempt to save the world with their data, technology, machines, and passion. That's what Mary Meeker said when she looked at the number of reports that were being published on COVID and, uh, and um, our immune systems and healthcare. What happened is we were having these, you know, yeah, we're, we're making progress on what healthcare is and all this. And then all of a sudden COVID-19 happened and everybody came whoosh, and we published an unprecedented, again, we're looking Looking at the hockey stick, number of papers about how to improve our immune systems. And so what this does is it allows new people to get seats at the table because companies who are most successful in the past have had a two to 10 year view at the, on the, you know, their moonshot companies who also have instant implementation. And these companies like Google and Apple and Facebook are realizing more than ever that they need experts. And so whether you want to go work for a Google or a big institution, you can position yourself as an expert, as an individual, or if you wanna go your own way, you can figure out how to eke your way and compete with these big players because of the way that digital marketing works, because of the fact that these digital channels are creating new and unprecedented adoption rates. And so because we're seeing this reallocation of labor, not since seen since World War II, you can get a seat at the table easily and like never before. And so I believe through my firm where I help bigger companies that the best minds should share their stories. The best brands should share their stories because it's the craftsmen, the people who are passionate about their craft, the people who are willing to go through the hero's journey who deserve recognition, who deserve to be heard. And they say that there's only 15 minutes of fame, but that's because most of what gets viral doesn't deserve more than 15 minutes of our time. Imagine if you, as an expert, could unlock this viral component and get the first 15 minutes, but then hold people's attention and get 15 minutes more and then 15 minutes more again. And imagine if you had an impact, a cause, something that you really love and stand for. That, I believe, is what life is about. And so I'm taking everything that I've learned with these big brands, selling a company to Twitter, working with luxury brands and Fortune 100 companies, and I'm interested in creating a grand experiment where I help individuals actually use the marketing channels and the methodologies that these big companies use to become famous, to make millions. And I've done this with direct-to-consumer mid-tier e-commerce companies where they've gone from baby startup to millions in organic search traffic. And I've watched these brands grow from two, three people to tons of people, to tons of advocates. And there's this saying that used to be, I think in 2010 it was developed and it said that you need just 1,000 true fans in order to make a living off of the internet. And that assumption operated off the fact that if you have a thousand people who will pay a hundred dollars for what it is that you offer, then you can make a living. And now they're saying because people are willing to spend so much more on authority content, on meaning, on things from people who have a passion, that actually they'll spend a thousand dollars what was once $100 willingness is 1,000. And so you only need 100 true fans to make a living. And you can do it on the side. And you can do it to get your next promotion. Or you can do it because you love something and you want to make it your full-time job or your next big company. And so if you want to join me on this challenge, text Lauren to 1323. 471-6894. This is 100% free. I'm just doing this because I'm super passionate. Hopefully you can see through Zoom. Um, 
and let me know that you're interested, that you want to spend a couple times a week where we actually go through what we were doing, you know, what, what I was talking about, and we look at how to implement it, whether you're developing your fundraising strategy for your advocacy or your next side income or your path to your next promotion or your next big company. I want to help you and I would love to do it together with you. So that's it for me. Wow, thank you so, so much um, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we have already some questions here in the chat. Uh, so we'll take the next 20 minutes or so um, to get those answered. And if you have any additional questions coming up as, as we start the discussion and the QA, Q and A portion of the session, um, please just add them to the chat and I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, Lauren, can you see the chat or you still can't see the chat? I can see the chat now, okay. but I haven't been tracking it, you know, so. Yeah, sure, sure. I just uh, still learn I just, how Zoom webinars work. <laughs> and I just put in also, if you don't want to join the challenge, you're like, nah, no challenges for me. Um, feel free to text or call me or email me. I just put my info there. Oh, thank you so much. Um, we already have a follow up question about the challenge. People want to know more. So we'll get to that. But we have an order in the questions. So we have organized ourselves in the chat. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to read the questions out to you and uh, you can answer them. Okay, so the first question is from David. Hi, David. It's great to see you here. I'm really excited that you were able to join the session. What's and David's last name? Neil, David Neil. Oh, cool. David and I worked um, on Pologia together in Cambridge. Okay, yeah, I recognize his name. <laughs> I just talk about you all the time, David. <laughs> um, that was weird. Okay, so David's question is, how in practical terms do you go about increasing the number of feedback loops that you're learning from on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that feedback loops are hard because we, we have a natural failure of aversion. Um, but what I try to do is look for the 80-20 and look for the leverage points and patterns in that 80-20 and to look for what's the 80-20 in the 80-20. So like what's the five minutes that you can spend in the 20 minutes of the 100 minutes. Um, and um, again, it's to think about what is the, how can you break what you're doing into smaller parts? For example, if you want to write a book, start with just testing headlines in Facebook and then test articles in Medium and then test articles in Inc or TechCrunch or whatever, and then write a mini book on Amazon Kindle, get reviews on that, take the feedback, and then write your actual book with a publisher and all those things provide proof and allow you to get feedback and this is what e-commerce does really well um, the bluetooth speakers that we have today from these small brands um, it's because uh, there's a company in jersey actually that made millions and what they would do is they would go on amazon and they would look in their category, like say they wanted to make a Bluetooth speaker, they would go to their category and they would look at all the reviews of Bluetooth speakers and they would say, oh my God, there's this trend that says that everybody wants a Bluetooth speaker they can bring to the pool without freaking out. You know, they want to know they can spill a beer on their Bluetooth speaker while they're partying. And so they would go and they would get feedback. What would happen if I made this Bluetooth speaker before they put it into manufacturing? And then they would get pre-orders on that. And then when they had enough that they knew that it was a viable idea, then they would make the Bluetooth speaker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a great way to think about how can you apply that to your field? Yeah. I actually, I'm just going to ask you a quick follow-up question because it made me think about, um, you know, people like myself who I write some sort of opinion uh, pieces sometimes, but it's quite rare. So 
what what advice do you give um, to people who are creating currently feedback loops, maybe like just writing LinkedIn posts or uh, kind of like starting to get their voice out there? What are the yeah. metrics and, you know, how do you know what lands and what doesn't and whether you should post every day or that's like yeah. very stressful for me personally, I like to have this pressure to post every day. So yeah, what advice would you give? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I think that um, it's really stressful to write every day, but you, but you have to do it. And what I would do is give myself like a time of, okay, 30 minutes, I will write every day. And um, if you find yourself procrastinating on it, implement getting stuff done sessions. These are sessions that you have an accountability partner. Um, you will meet for an hour. For the first five minutes, you talk about what the thing that you can do that's the biggest impact in the next 50 minutes that will make a difference to your business and then at the end of the 55 minutes you meet for another five minutes and you talk about how it went and you celebrate your wins and so if you were going to do this on linkedin say what i would do is i would pretend like i'm writing an email to the person who represents my audience and i would make them like a really cute or like really nice um, thing so that it's not scary, right? So you're just writing a little email or like a letter and it's really, you know, it's sweet almost. Um, and that makes it a lot easier that that removes a lot of the fear. And then you, you make a schedule. Okay, I'm just going to post this. And then you look at how many times was it viewed? How many times was it liked? And how many times was it commented on? And why? Um, you can start to get a sense of the why. Um, and then I would read what is the LinkedIn algorithm versus the Twitter algorithm. For example, right now, LinkedIn is, is investing heavily in video. And so if you create a, a LinkedIn live, LinkedIn will say like, ooh, here's a video and we want to make video really famous. And so we're going to promote this to literally every connection that this person has. So that's a really good way to even think about, you know, cross platform on how things uh, change. Okay. Pros and cons of LinkedIn and Medium. I would uh, first write where you um, write on something that you own, right? Because um, if you write on a third party platform like LinkedIn or Medium, basically they kind of own your content and they can choose to do whatever you, they want with it. For example, on Facebook, there used to be people who spent hundreds of millions of dollars to get page likes because 30% of people when Facebook was humming along really well would see every post update. And now um, Facebook is showing at tops 1% of page posts to people. And so page posts don't really work. And so you don't wanna write on LinkedIn or Medium only and be um, subject to their algorithm changes and their priorities. First write on your own blog and then put it on LinkedIn and Medium. And keep in mind how the different platforms are different. Um, so on LinkedIn, I would think about, can I make this into a video? Um, how can I connect this to different, um, like things that people are talking about in business? On Medium, I would think about how do I make this a thoughtful piece of content? And how do I get a lot of claps or likes really quickly after I generate this piece of content so that I get up in the face or in the medium algorithm. And then in Facebook, I would say, what groups can I join on my topic? And how do I get feedback and lots of um, lots of engagement with my posts so that my posts show up higher in the group? Okay, great. And is this like stuff that you also cover in the challenge? Um, it is. Okay, great. Yep. And we'll look at the metrics and everything. Okay, wonderful. Um, so now we have a question from Heidegi, um, who said, Lauren, are you saying that you would recommend social justice advocates, for instance, to also utilize these digital marketing platforms for their messages, i.e. not just selling products or promoting companies? Um, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially right now in the great refactoring, um, you know, there's so much people are 
are consuming more digital content than ever before. Um, they're watching YouTube longer than ever before. And um, unfortunately, a lot of these algorithms, they start to, they help you, they get, it's like a magnet to find people who align with your beliefs. And so once you get in like sort of a belief loop, you'll get more content from people who also are pitching sort of the same thing. Um, so for example, on TikTok, like I was talking about, uh, you, you know, you could start to create content about, you know, gender equality. And actually I've seen, I, I have to look at the example, um, but I've seen a lot of BLM activism on TikTok and it just goes super viral because for better or worse, it's really trendy right now to have a blacked out Facebook post or, you know, Facebook profile picture or, you know, that's your profile. Um, so 100% um, digital media changes the way that we think it wires our brains. And if you can be a part of that, it's super fundamental um, to how people actually spend their money. Maybe I'll also ask a follow-up question, just kind of knowing um, who we have here today, uh, many of whom uh, work in healthcare or policy. And uh, can you talk a little bit about um, any risks that you can see to someone in that position also kind of going out into the world and using these digital marketing techniques? Because of course, uh, some of these fields are regulated and um, there's a slight difference between being an activist and a policymaker or an advocate or a healthcare professional. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I used to do marketing work for Pfizer or a pharma company. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. And uh, the, you know, the, the amount of legal was insane, especially at the beginning of social media. And so you want to make sure that you hit your high spots on your disclaimers. If you have a blog, you know, you want to make sure that you have a privacy policy um, at terms of service. You want to make sure that you have disclaimers of, you know, these are my opinions and they're not the opinions of hiring organization. Um, and I'm not a legal person, so I can't give you like, a, this is my exact recommendation, but I have seen lots of templates that work. Um, and then I think too, like, the haters still help you in the algorithm. Um, you know, if, if, if you get engagement, it helps even a, a dislike on YouTube helps you get more views, um, because you're creating feelings in people and feelings are what make things go viral. Um, and it's big and it's scary, but again, if you're pleasing everyone, you're not pushing hard enough. Mm, yeah, for sure. So in your challenge, do you help people not get heartbroken from dislikes yeah okay no, i can do that i can be your therapist <laughs> i think that might be a worry here also no you know actually, i know it is for me <laughs> actually um i've heard there's someone i work with his name is is matt and he has um short fingers and he never talked about it ever and he made a tiktok about that and about how he got made fun of and um i've seen lots of people talking about their own alcohol alcoholism and the amount of people who swoop in and support you because they see themselves in you or they feel your love they they have a sense of empathy is absolutely unbelievable and there are trolls, but like, if you're trolling, like you have way too much time, you know, you have way too much time and you need to get a life. Um, so, and again, it's, it's feedback, right? It, a lot of times they say the best sales letters um, actually explain the flaws in the product and why you should overlook them. Because there's flaws in everything. That's, that's what it is to be human. Um, and uh, we, when we commit to a relationship, we find flaws in our partner, but without those flaws, we wouldn't love them as much. Um, so I don't know if that helps, but 
It does. Just I can see it's a, it's a good preview to how you're going to smooth these emotions over in the challenge. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have another question from Haile Kim. Uh, she also asks, uh, she'd like to hear more, a bit more about how to refine one's purpose beyond contributing to a broader field or cause. So kind of what you were talking about at the beginning. Um, I think everyone here has sort of a sense of mission and wanting to make a positive difference in the world, uh, but there's so many different ways to do that. So uh, what advice would you give her? Uh beyond a cause. Can you help me with that a little? Like, so, uh, well, maybe Heidi can help you. <laughs> and your drive? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I think what she means, Heidi, oh, Bensei is helping us because Bensei is asking Heidi's questions because they have some sort of filtering Screen going on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's Heidi. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what she means, um, and she'll confirm in a minute, is, you know, she works in the field of gender equality and, um, mm. and how to increase gender equality in the world. And there's, uh, that's, so that's the field, but like, what should she do in that field? I think that's what you're asking, Heidi Kim. Yeah, how to refine the purpose. Um, yeah, okay, so how to find your angle within a broader field. Right. So I think that there's three. Uh, one thing is your experience. Um, I think this is part of why the Me Too movement worked is because unfortunately, um, the, a lot of the people who spoke out were actually victims of sexual harassment or whatever happened. So, you know, your ex experience is a big one because you can speak to um, you can speak to whatever the issue is more um in a more real way that resonates and you can solve people's very specific problems um uh, just because you had the experience in a way that you know no one else has and anyone who's been like first time going to school the new kid in school or the new kid at a job like you sort of know what that feels like but then when you do it you really know what that feels like mm -hmm. um, and it changes how you treat the new kid forever um, the other thing I would look at is what is your passion? How do you want to spend your time? Um, can you imagine yourself talking about the smaller thing and the bigger thing every single day? And what does it mean to talk about it emotionally, um, thought process wise? And then the last one is like, where do you have a special angle, right? Like, what do you have that's a gift that no one else has? Um, for example, I think that being from Estonia is a gift. You have different experiences and, and even probably a different mind in some ways um, than other people. <laughs> Thank you for singling out the Estonians in this <laughs> in the session. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in the, that's a really, it's a really hard thing. Um, I have a framework for doing that and um we'll we'll go through that in the in the challenge yeah okay i was just gonna ask um yeah so this is also covered in the challenge great um okay so uh ben say also has a question lauren what dangers do you think these opportunities of reaching so many people have in terms of fake news or being used in a profit oriented way and how can we avoid these he also says lauren please tell us more about this challenge <laughs> okay, so first it's um, what's the danger with fake news and co the commercialization of things, right? Um, I, I have a really, really weird view on this, and I think a lot of people would hate me for it, but I believe that algorithms and fake news, these are just the new vehicles for getting information out, and I don't believe in playing dirty but I do believe in understanding the algorithms. And I do believe that, um, you know, for example, I, I am not personally as active in protest as much as I want to generate enough money so that I can donate to the people who are protesting in a certain way. I believe that that money does affect people's abilities to um, mobilize and make an impact um, 
it's a lot easier if you have some Facebook dollars to go viral on Facebook than if you don't. Um, so, and I think that humans are naturally consumers and that many of our, our decision patterns are based on our emotions and the jobs that we want to be done. And so I don't think it's necessarily bad to sell a t-shirt about your, you know, hey, I donated to this or I voted um, and make money and then filter that money back to um, a cause. And I know that lots of people are already doing this. And so the question is, do you believe in your cause so much and the, the lack it's like, do I, do you want to play the game or do you not? And I believe in playing the game. I don't believe in playing the game dirty, but I believe in, you know, being a really good tennis player and like, you know, learning the tennis tricks without cheating. Yeah, for sure. I think maybe there's also um, just my own reflection on this has been, um, you know, you've helped me look through some of my area of expertise online and kind of what's going on there. And, and uh, you've already been teaching me a little bit about these techniques. And what I see is that even though it's very, very uncomfortable to think about doing it this way, um, because of the implications or sort of, yeah, the risks maybe involved with it, I also see that I have the kind of expertise that not many other people have. And I have, you know, been very, very <laughs> blessed in terms of the support I've gotten to get my education. And so uh, if I don't speak up in my area of expertise, there's so many people who actually are speaking from um, not a, not a very well informed point of view and getting a lot of followers. And of course, I mostly work in health. So it always concerns me uh, when there's a Facebook group that's, you know, telling people how to lose weight. And I'm just like, Oh, my God, you're literally going to kill someone with this advice that just came from Google or something like this. So um, yeah, I see it as you know, we can be as like, like a balancing force maybe to that uh, side of the to yeah, the you have, side. <laughs> yeah, you have to always work with under like a, you have to be have integrity. But yeah, there are like the economy, there are people making gazillions of dollars teaching other people how to do things because they can make gazillions of dollars, not because they're qualified. And so if you don't speak up, you're doing society a disservice. And also that's like, that's not about the method. The method in itself isn't good or bad or dangerous or, or safe. It's how you use it and how you um, use it as a vehicle for your message, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, now we have a question from uh, Joachim. So he says, what personally owned platform would you recommend in light of the 2080 method? I can't seem to get away from a dot-com website like Celia. Yes, I'm biased. Well. Uh, can't seem to get away like can't, can't get one? Or? Um, what did you mean here, Trow? Mm, I can't think of a better alternative for myself, he says. Oh, okay. Um, I would look at your strengths, right? If you're great on camera, and you're, you know, likable, um, choose YouTube. Uh, if you like to write, then, you know, get a blog and a medium or start a Facebook group. It really just depends on your strengths. We'll help on that in the challenge. And um, I didn't answer before what the challenge looks like. We will meet three or four times over the course of two weeks. And we will go through basically the process that we did. I'll give you feedback. I'll help you figure out how to monetize and or find the platforms that work for you and then create a framework for how to continue and learn from these feedback loops. Great, thank you. So Joe also has a follow-up question, his first question. He says, how much of the work should I outsource considering I'm rather broke for the moment? So what are some of the more affordable ways to get a personal website or a personally owned something that looks good? Yeah, um, I would say use templates as much as you can. Um, 
they're drag and drop builders that are, you know, really good right now. Um, and or you have to go through that 80-20 process. It's something that I will guide you on. You shouldn't have to outsource anything right now. And, um, you know, the reason to get some first sales to monetize your expertise is so that you can get your voice out further. And so what I want to do, um, and I haven't figured out how far I'll go into this, is, um, you know, how do you generate some revenue so that you can get people to help you to do the things that you're not great at? Okay, great. Um, but is the challenge also for people who um, don't want to sell anything? They just want totally. to. Yeah. Okay. hundred percent. All are accepted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Any other questions, guys? Um, we're just about running out of time. So um, if you have any last questions, do write them in the chat. Um, let's see, I actually wrote some questions down. Maybe I can ask them while other people <laughs> are, um, let's see. So, oh, so one thing that you said is you would, um, you know, recommend people to be sincere in their, in their communication, in the, in their thought leadership. So what would you say are some of the best ways to do that? Um, yeah, there's actually proof that you buy more from the things that you love, the people who you like. Um, and I think that the best way to be likable is to show empathy. And so I would think about what is it about my experience that other people also have, or what is it that I care about that other people also care about? And right now, actually on Facebook, if you, you can get videos views for about, if you pay for them, for about two cents on average and three cents on YouTube. And people will watch like 20 minute webinars like this. Like I could go advertise this for two cents a piece and get views on it. Um, and so, and this is like bad content or it's not bad. Content. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, it's not like what you think about as like, Ooh, here's a commercial, you know, no, like this is just me standing in a room and there was somebody in the background, but people still watch this because it's, 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 it's me and it's what I believe in, what I'm passionate about. So I would just think about that. Start talking about your passion. <laughs> well, Bensley says that you look like a great commercial, so oh. you're just going to have to change your perception here. Um, and then my last question, which I think will be, um, you know, a nice way to kind of wrap up the session today is um, you mentioned this refactoring and the sort of like shift in society right now. So do you see more opportunity for ex experts to contribute to the world and societal narratives beyond traditional industry silos like academia or government has traditionally provided? Is yeah. it like the moment where it becomes more possible? Yeah. Um, more and more people are opting out of getting a college education and instead they're buying literal certifications from marketers who are teaching people how to market just like I just did for you. Um, it's really crazy. Um, and this is happening in lots of, maybe not so much like traditional STEM necessarily, um, but people's values are really evolving and, you know, we're not buying from like our buying patterns are different and there's this thing called uh, challenger brands and it's these brands who are not market leaders they enter the market because they have a greater purpose um and i will if you send me an email i'll send the slides as and i'll send i'll send you the slides or you have everyone's email right yeah, I'm going to okay, I'll send I'm, the slides in a book that you can read about challenger brands and how to be a challenger brand. And it's basically, you know, the um, environmental like shoes that you see coming on the market or Warby Parker glasses that are cheaper. Um, and so like everything about what we're doing is getting a new coat and it's it's changing, you mm -hmm. know, our buying patterns because of COVID 
like that used to be that the prediction was that 95% of our transactions would happen online before by 2040. Uh, because of COVID, that's now 2030. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess the connection for um, sort of other like types of expertise or expertise that is usually shared in the in the public sector would be that it's actually useful to uh, view buying patterns for that sector as well, because what people buy, they tend to be interested in, or they tend to need, or um, it sort of shows like shifts in maybe people's beliefs or attitudes. Another big shift in beliefs is, you know, if you were my parents and you put away $5,000 when you were, you know, you started putting away or $500, you know, whatever, like, every single year from when you were 20, you would make less than if you invested in crypto in 2010, the same $5,000. And so our whole systems are changing, right? Like wealth creation is changing. Uh, the way that people feel about their jobs, um, I'm gonna get a job and I'm gonna be protected in this job and this is how I'm gonna retire when I'm 65. Like people are getting dumped by their big corporations. And when you get laid off, I know personally, how terrible that is and how much it changes how you think about the companies that employ you. Uh, Cause I gave my life to a company and they just dumped me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's happening everywhere around the world. And so it's, it's like, what, what does it mean to be a company now? And yeah. what does it mean to dedicate myself to something? Should I do it for this big company who's gonna dump me? Or should I go with my best friend and figure out the tools that I need to create value and have more liberty to do what I need because I'm not some part of something bigger. Um, I'm part of a bigger cause, but I'm more agile. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing your expertise with us. And I'm very excited to join Lauren's challenge. I will uh, send out an email with the recording of this webinar, Lauren's contact details, so you can find out more about the challenge. And I'm also going to send the slides. Um, and I thought I would add in maybe Mary Meeker's report. It seems like a good sort of like base level reading for this. Um, uh, yes, and Ben Sales I'll send all the report. Stuff. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and your attention and taking, you know, an hour and 12 minutes out of your day. I really, it means a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And have a great day or evening. And we'll see you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.